everybody talks about like the record industry. I was inside a corporation. Welcome to episode seven of Art Design Music. This one is a big one. Well, it's actually our shortest episode as far as length goes, but it's a big one in that today's guest is a very big deal. I'm Judd Haynes, a graphic designer and illustrator from Newfoundland, Canada, and this podcast features conversations with visual artists that create work for the music industry. Show posters, album covers, music videos, band photography, that kind of stuff. You can find the show on Instagram and Facebook at Art Design Music Podcast, and our website is artdesignmusic.com. I want to thank everybody who has given our first few episodes a shot, and especially to those of you that have decided to write in, whether on social media or by email. It's been really exciting to hear how so many of you have been using the show notes posted on our website. Wherever possible, I've gone through and collected images of every poster or music video or graphic design project that's been discussed and posted them in the show notes that go with each episode so that folks can follow along. If you're out walking the dog, then I totally understand that you can't partake and check out those show notes. But if you're home, chilling with your iPad, then I welcome you to follow along with all the graphics and all those posters, because seeing is believing and it's a lot more fun too. I can't believe we've made it to episode 7 already. This season of 10 Conversations has been flying by. You're invited to be part of our 11th episode. You can send along a short tale about your favorite album cover or concert poster. Send us some show ideas or suggestions if there are artists out there that you think we should be covering. And if you'd like to ask a question, well, we'll answer a ton of those in episode 11 as well. So send along your questions or stories to artdesignmusicpodcast at gmail.com and we'll see you on episode 11. So... As I mentioned, today's guest is a big deal. I'd go far as to say she's one of the biggest names in graphic design on the planet. She's currently a partner at Pentagram, the world's largest independent design agency. Of all the conversations I had for this first season of Art Design Music, this one with Paula Cher is the one that had me the most nervous as she is someone I've looked up to my entire career. But no matter how freaked out I was, nothing prepared me for when we first connected via Zoom and she insisted I turn on my camera. Obviously, this podcast is audio only, so all my conversations up to date have been without any video. So... I turned on my camera, and I could see that Paula was in her gorgeous Connecticut studio, surrounded by large canvases of her art, flooded with natural light, and there I was, in my sound booth recording pod, with heavy blankets hung for sound dampening, and one very unflattering light hung high above my head. While she could see my face and probably hear the fear in my voice, Paula was nothing but gracious, inspirational, educational, and hilarious. A true professional and delight. Let's dive in. But hi, Paula. How are you? Oh, pretty good. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much again for coming on today and having a chat. Before we start talking about design and music, I wanted to quickly touch upon your youth because that kind of set all this stuff in motion. So where did you grow up? I grew up outside of Washington, D.C., mostly in Silver Spring, Maryland. And I went to school at Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. When all the other kids were going off on Saturdays playing football and going to cheerleading practice, you oftentimes found yourself sneaking off to go do something else. What was that? I took Saturday morning art classes at uh, the Corcoran School of Art uh, that was in the Corcoran Museum. And I uh, went down on Saturday mornings, taking three public buses to get there from Silver Spring, Maryland. And I was a kid and I went to art school with uh, these uh, beatniks. And you kept that part of what you were doing a little bit secret for a while. Well, it wasn't done. I mean, I went to a suburban high school and and you were supposed to go to a specific type of activity and this wasn't on the list. A little bit later on, what you were doing did come into play because you started being asked to design posters for your school and you were doing the art and kind of design for a bunch of like school dance posters and things like that. I was uh, what was known as good at art. You know, nobody knew what design was yet. So I was the school artist and I made all the posters for things I never went to. Would these school posters have been kind of your first experience with design? I do 
didn't separate design from drawing. I didn't I didn't know there was a difference. Sometimes I made things and I had to draw a type on it because it had titles. I had a friend whose father uh, was a bridge expert and I made a cover for one of his books that he used. He used to write for the Washington Post. Oh, nice, nice. And was your family supportive of your uh, pursuit of art? Not especially. No. Uh, no, they didn't get it. They didn't, they didn't think it was a viable profession. Your father was a, a cartographer. Yes, but that's not an artist. He was an engineer. Yeah, yeah. He was the coordinator of nations mapping, and um, he invented a device called stereo templates that corrected the lens distortion in aerial photography. And uh, he created an equation by which you could you could correct the distortion, and the photography would come out correct because the curvature of the Earth would be taken into account in his proportions. And without that invention, there'd be no Google Maps. Wow, that's amazing. However, he got a $1,500 check from the government for his invention. Oh, no. No, oh, not really. <laughs> he was a real civil servant. It was sort of great. I hate to bring up this story, but it is an interesting one that I do think is important for people to hear. You had some supportive teachers and you had one particular teacher who kind of wasn't... <laughs> Yes, I had a teacher for my um, freshman um, that was called uh, basic design. And it was taught on the Basel method. And you moved uh, a black square around a white page so you could see uh, scale and how, the, how space would change when you moved the square. And you had to make exercises with it where you pasted it down or you had white and white experiments where you cut out shapes and pasted them down. And you pasted them with something called uh, rubber cement. And rubber cement used to leak off the sides of the things that you cut out. You had to pick it up with a rubber cement thinner, or you had to pick it up with a little pickup that would bend the paper so it looked dirty and messy. And everything I brought in was just terrible. And uh, Bob Stein um, looked at my work, and he thought I was just horrible. And at the end of the year, when he was giving me my final review, he asked me why I wanted to go to art school. And I said, I wanted to be an artist. And he said, cooking is an art. And uh, that's all right. He uh, invited me back years later when I was at CBS, actually. And he invited me to, to PCA to speak to his class. And you know, at that point in time, I designed quite a bit of my work covers and, and, and was known for it. And he introduced me to the class this way. He said, this is a former student of mine, and I can take absolutely no credit for his success. Yeah, yeah. I heard you tell that story once before, and it just killed me. I do think that there will be people listening who haven't heard it before and do need to hear that. You know, when your teachers are tell you something, they're not always right, and you go on and end up becoming the best in the world at something. <laughs> Well, my mother was worse. I mean, when I told her I wanted to move to New York to be a designer, she said, oh, Paula, don't do anything like that. That sounds like it takes talent. <laughs> well, she wasn't wrong. She was a motivating factor. Exactly. Sometimes a, a bit of uh, spite and stubbornness can take us pretty far. Was the teacher that had said that to you the same teacher that started teaching you a bit about hand painting typography? Although it wasn't hand painting typography and it wasn't the same teacher. Uh, you're talking about Stanislaw Zagorski, who was a, a, a Polish designer who um, did a lot of surface posters and cultural posters in Poland before he came over to the United States in a tradition of great poster design. And he began working in books and in record covers. He did uh, the Creams, uh, gosh, I forgot the name of the album. It's a silver cover. Uh, Wheels on Fire. And uh, he was a hero. I mean, he was he was a youth culture star when he was my teacher. Wow. I, he would give assignments and they were generally things that were fairly illustrative. It was it was problem solving. He would give you a, a book to design a cover for, a record to design a cover for, a poster to make, those sorts of things. And at that point in time, I wanted to be an illustrator, not a designer, because I didn't understand the difference. And the kids in my class who wanted to be designers worked with press type to make their typography, and they rubbed it down. It was all very neat, and sort of done in a Swiss modern style. And I couldn't do that because I was too sloppy, left over from my freshman experience. And I would draw the type, and it would look like terrible. Uh, it just would look horrible. Or I'd rub it down with press type, and it would crack and bend. And... He said something to me. It was really three words. He got me to stop trying to make the type the way I was making it. And he said, illustrate the type, mm -hmm. meaning use the type to convey the spirit of the image, not necessarily draw the type, but maybe 
fracture the type or manipulate the type. And those three words gave me my whole career. Wow. I always thought it was just about the fact of illustrating it as opposed to using a font or something like that. And, uh, you know, but like you say, the way you can break it or change it. And I, so much of your work that you ended up doing kind of later on, you did, you're putting the text on the side, you're putting it all upside down and making movement and action and everything with it. So uh, that's a very interesting pursuit. You had mentioned on the Netflix episode about you on, of, on Abstract um, that when you were a kid, you were influenced by all these different sources. And the one you kind of were the most enthusiastic about was album art and album covers. Um, so I'm wondering about how exciting it must have been then to suddenly move to New York after school and then you end up landing a job at CBS. I was given, I was sent to the advertising department at CBS Records from a boss I had when I worked at Random House designing the insides of children's books. And I was about 22 years old um, at this particular point in time. And I'd come to New York with a portfolio. And Zagorski, my teacher, had set up appointments with me, um, which is how I met my husband, Seymour Kwas, and how I met so many art directors in New York. You could do it then. It was the wide open profession. So I was a little kid with a portfolio and I got hired to do record ads in the CBS Records Art Department. And that's actually when I first won awards. Um, and I, I made a big poster for Sly um, when he just left the family stone that got into the art directors club. And I had done um, some other ads that were notable. And Bob Deffren hired me for my advertisements, but the actual art department that he ran had covers and ads in the same department, which is how I got to design covers. But it was really, I was here, I was at CBS a little less than two years before I was hired by Bob. And I was only in Atlantic one year before I went back to CBS. During that year, you designed probably around 15 records from what I can tell. You might, might be more. It was 25. Oh, wow. Yeah. Amazing. Well, like everything, a lot of them were bad. I think there were, there were, you know, maybe five or six notable ones and they won awards. So that, that, that's where I thought, and I haven't talked about this enough, but that's where I think design was such an open profession because here I was, I was a woman and I could design these things and enter them into competitions and nobody knew who I was and the judges just picked them. Hmm. And um, that's how I sort of began to become known. And do you remember the first record you would have done? The first album cover I did was, I think, for Ornette Coleman uh, or Coleman Hawkins. The title of its alternate takes, and I can't remember which Coleman it was. So then you're there for uh, only a couple of years. On you. Really, November to November. And then you end up back at CBS, um, but now you're an art director working in the cover department. Okay. During this period of time, you're there for about eight years, and you're averaging somewhere in the vicinity of up to 150 albums a year. Yep. This is something that kind of blows my mind because I know a lot of graphic designers don't make 150 records in their entire careers. How did you manage to produce that much work? Well, first of all, I have to, I have to sort of uh, change the perception of that. 150 covers is what I was responsible for. And some of those I designed myself. Some of them were uh, like hypnosis uh, did Pink Floyd and I came into the States and I just simply just shepherded it through the, the department. Uh, I ran uh, the country music department from Nashville and my friend Virginia team was came up and I had to do administrative things with that as well. And uh, what I did is I, um, I sort of shot called, I mean, it was East coast art director and that was my responsibility for those albums. Um, but I would take uh, a number of major artists to work on to make sure that um I was handling enough of the very political work that the company cared about. And then I would take jazz albums and classical albums and people that were dropped from the label because I, nobody cared about those things politically. And that's where I could do my good work. During that time, you worked on records for, and I know some of it was like, say, art directing. You might have been hiring illustrators, hiring uh, type designers, and some of them you were designing yourself. But I mean, some of the ones that your name was associated with was for, you know, albums for Bob Dylan, for Boston, for the Hollies, Cheap Trick, Paul Simon, the Chieftains, who in my part of the world here in Newfoundland are, are uh, royalty, um, Patti LaBelle, Johnny Winter, Blue Oyster Cult, Bobby McFerrin, Rolling Stones, Billy Joel, Richard Marks, John Coltrane. Like the list is incredible and quite a, a time capsule. Well, I do want to ask you about a couple records. And it's kind of cool that you just a second ago mentioned that jazz was where you got to kind of like really strut your stuff and have some fun. You were nominated for four Grammy nominations for design. 
The one record that you worked on that the entire design world is really in love with was your Bob James and Earl Clue record for one-on-one. The gatefold record looks like a classic matchbook. The idea is so gorgeous and so creative. The, the uh, Bob James covers for Tad and Z were a series. Uh, Bob had done uh, a series previously, actually. He was on Atlantic. I didn't know him then, but he had, he had hired uh, one photographer. I think his last name was Turner. Um, I can't remember the names of people very well now, but he had done all the, all the covers. They had to set similar looks because it was the same photographer. And when I met him, he wanted his own series. He just launched Happens Z Records. And I think there were 17 of these in all. Um, but I had the idea of doing um, big objects blown out of scale. There was a, there was a nickel, there was a hot dog, there was uh, a, a football. Um, they were based on the number of the album. So um, like the, um, I think the nickel was the fifth album. And mostly they were shot by um, John Paul Andrews, uh, who did a lot of work for me then, but, but, one on one was actually shot by Arnold Rosenberg, and they were still live photographers. And I would I would select what the item was and sort of make a sketch for the guys on the scale proportions, and then crop them and put them together. I have to say I love those albums. I'm I'm really proud of them as a series. And one on one was definitely the best. And we we printed it. Um, I I really when I could I got involved with productions of things, you know. And it was very hard to get the record industry to, to vary from their sort of four color production process and the way they folded the things. And these things were what was called interpacks, meaning that they opened up mm-hmm. so that you had insides for material and then there would be inner sleeves. And one-on-one was printed on the wrong side of the board. So it actually had a feeling of a matchbook. That was what I thought was really cool about it. And the others were a little slick and glossy and, and some were better than others. There was also grapes and screw. And I mean, they're, they're, they're a pile of them. I have most of them, actually. I saved them. I, I like them at the time. One-on-one, the orientation of that record is also on its side. So the spine would be facing up in order for it to open like a matchbook. And uh, even something as simple as that, I bet you, uh, you know, would be breaking the norms for a standard uh, record label. And they might kind of, you know, start thinking that, that you're getting crazy. Actually, the uh, politics were easy in those situations. Number one, um, I worked directly with Bob and his, his uh, management company, and they were great. And number two, it was a jazz album. Nobody had high ex- expectations of it. If the artist was very powerful and the artist wanted something specific, you could get it made. If it was an up and coming artist uh, until they had broken through, then they would do those things on the cheap and you really wouldn't be able to move things around. So you were, everybody talks about like the record industry. I was inside a corporation. It operated like a corporation. It had hierarchies like a corporation. I learned everything I learned about business and politics from that place. I was there, you know, a total of 10 years and eight in one job. And, um, I, I, everything I know now about how to operate and how to behave, I learned in that, in that job when I was in my twenties. Um, the other records from the same period that were also jazz records was the Charles Mingus one and two, um, which were very fun. I was wondering, did those records come out at the same time? Uh, they were, they were both at Atlantic. Um, I did, they were, they were among the early ones I did in my first, in my one year Atlantic, I think that the covers that were noted, notable were uh, Charles Mingus and John Prine, Common Sense. And the design and the layout you did on those was um, was really, really remarkable. It was kind of a, a very fun use of typography and kind of, you know, like say, there's no there's no set image. It's basically all typography on those covers. Well, that's very me, um, you know, that when I'm using my own vocabulary and I'm not art directing, that's what I that's what I would make. And that's that type was drawn by hand. I mean, it was the the fonts didn't exist, but which mm-hmm. was part of the challenge about working with typography in those days. I had a, a couple lettering artists that I would work with, and they would craft it for me, and and you know I would redraw and we'd craft and do that, and that 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 was my art then. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons I paint these maps now is that my artwork was taking a piece of um, prepared acetate and putting it over a photograph and painting the typography by hand. Wow. I was, I was never a master at it, but I could do it. Now I, now I do it for fun. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, yeah, and it is very beautiful. Uh, I'm going to ask you more about those maps in a, in a couple minutes, actually, because they are, are a big part of this story. Well, another big thing that I've noticed when I look through your catalog of records going through the 70s and then through the 80s, uh, so many of them had illustrations on the covers as opposed to photos. And this was in an era, which is not unlike now, actually, where photography was basically the norm. It's like everybody was putting pictures of themselves or pictures of the band on the, on the covers. And you were kind of advocating a lot for illustration. Part of the problem with the job, and again, it had to do with how successful the recording artist was. The job, if you only did pop stars, you essentially were like being a hairdresser. Um, your job was to take the recording artist and get them set up with their stylist and get their hairdresser and set up the good photographer. There was a wonderful guy named Bill King I used to work with a lot. He was a very good fashion photographer. Another guy named James Hawk. And you would try to make them feel good about their photo sessions. Now, I remember I got Richard Avedon to shoot Phoebe Snow and she was completely miserable. I mean, she felt so insecure and her management was sort of pushing her for this sort of beauty thing. And she never thought she was pretty. Um, and then I hired Benno Friedman, who wasn't as famous a photographer, and she was just more comfortable with him. Uh, and, and that if I had to do it over again, illustration probably would have been a, a way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. But I also hated it because I hated the role it put me in. I really don't like that kind of art direction. And I hated going to photo sessions. I mean, Bill King, who was great, said he loved working with me because he said I would come down, have my effect, and leave. Uh, <laughs> nice. Which is, you know, really all it needed. You know, you were sort of supposed to stay on the set. It was really did the, did, did the photographer and, the, and the, the, the group, the band, have a chemistry. And, you know, for cheap trick, they never liked their heads on their bodies. I mean, we used to take up cut out their heads and move them around and put them on other bodies and other, <laughs> from other parts of the photo session because they said, well, I like my body over here, but I want this picture in my face. You know, and then in those days, because there was, again, no computer, you had to make a, something that was uh, called dye transfer. And it had to be um, touched with sandpaper to get rid of the edges that would show when you glued it down. I oh, mean, it was wow. really quite an elaborate process. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a cheap trick album called Dream Police that has a fold out on the inside of a pile of policemen standing together and the, the band is handcuffed to themselves. So they're shown twice. So there are eight pictures all with different heads on different bodies. What a nightmare. <laughs> Which, like I say, if you're doing it now in Photoshop, would only take a few minutes. But, oh, take but back then, I mean, that was a real craft and a real art to be able to pull that together. However, I have a theory about that. Things always had to go out. They always had to be finished. They to, they, there was never any time to do anything, and you had this very elaborate way of working. And I think at that point in time, I was East Coast art director. I think there were five designers working for me and a mechanical. That department made 150, 150 covers a year. Wow. Then I went up to the CBS art department, uh, you know, 20 years later, and they're making the same 150 covers a year. And in the day I did it, you made uh, a 12 by 12 album cover that had liner notes that sometimes opened up. Uh, sometimes there was operas with librettos. Sometimes there were, and then you did all these things with cassettes because there were cassettes then. So you had that mm -hmm. technology and sometimes still eight track tapes. So we're doing all these versions of this thing. And in the other department, they had they weren't doing all of that. They were just really making making the albums that got re re reduced. CDs had already disappeared, and I, I thought, well, what are what are they doing with the extra time? Because they don't, you know, it's the same amount of work and the same amount of people. And I, then I realized what they were doing. They were making changes. You didn't have time to be political. Yes, you couldn't mess something up. And the proofreaders were better. They made fewer mistakes. You didn't have any time. And I remember uh, hearing you say once, because uh, you just talked about cassettes and kind of moving into that era, uh, the allure for designing records kind of diminished substantially when CDs and jewel cases became the norm. Yes, I, 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 that's when I stopped because they had, um, it wasn't that interesting. Very few designers, I think, did well in that media. I mean, I know Stefan Sagmeister, his work I thought was beautiful and he used the form well. But very, very little that was produced really demanded that. You know, at first there were, you know, first you were slipping it into those stupid plastic cases that you didn't really need because the technology was more robust than an album cover that was just stuck in a piece of cardboard. And the um, 
digipacks, which could open and fold around, were a little more interesting. Like you had, had a little more surface to play with as a designer when you could really do something perhaps memorable. But mostly it's bad packaging. And then it was no fun to look for in the record store. You know, like it was like there were little things that you're looking at. You know, sometimes they came in long, skinny record covers sort of folded in half. So, I mean, it was just everything about it was wrong. Yeah, I've always felt the jewel case was one of the worst designed things ever. And it's shocking that they lasted for like 30 years. They crack, they break, put them in your car and then they're destroyed. You have one of my favorite quotes actually about this kind of, uh, you know, the, the kind of changeover. And that was, you kind of moved on from music because you wanted to design something that wasn't square. That's true. I mean, I, I figured at one point, well, and I had to have made it over a thousand squares. You know, I mean, they were, they were essentially the same form over and over again, though designing for music was fantastic. Even when I went into my own business, I still I still worked for record labels. I worked on Manhattan Records uh, when Bruce Lumball took it over for two years and did some work with Blue Note, which was not very good. During that time, you were one of the most prolific album cover art directors. I was trying to get some little stats on kind of how many albums have sold that have your art on the cover or your art direction. And I lost count after like 100 million sales which is really astronomical that your name is in at least that many records that are out there in people's homes. Let's pop a, a little bit beyond music now, because I can say the music part of your story, I feel like is basically like before they've even shown the, the name of the movie, <laughs> what has become the lore of Paula Cher really happened after music. I'd like to just really quickly, um, if you could explain to our listeners what Pentagram is. Uh, Pentagram is um the organization uh, that is my design organization. And it's got uh, now 24 partners worldwide. Uh, very unusual because it's a cooperative. And I can't figure out why there, there aren't more of them, but mm. I, think it, I think they're probably incredibly hard to establish. Uh, Pentagram is, is going to be 50 years old in uh, 2022. We're actually work, working on a book on the 50th anniversary. And what made the, the corporation last is the idea of what it would be. It's a, it's a group of designers who um, share profit and uh, run their businesses as suits them and hire employees as suits them. And their responsibility to the group is to make a profit, do good work, and uh, be a proactive member of the group. And uh, what it's capable of doing because of the people who founded it and how it's moved through the years is attract the best designers working. What happened with most really important design firms is that one, two or three people found it and they go up, they, they grow it and it gets bigger and they get older and then they die and then the place falls apart. And that we're probably, I think we're, we are the largest independently owned design consultancy in the world. But we've been able to go into three generations and attract really wonderfully talented partners. And, and to be a partner, you have to have um, a distinguished body of work in whatever the area is that you, that you work in. I mean, we have <clears throat> product designers. There have been architects, though not currently. Uh, there are industrial designers. There are um, you know, digital designers, and I'm an environmental designer as well as a graphic designer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we each have our own teams, and the teams are like little cells within an organization. They can be different sizes, and everybody has uh, a level of design that we all agree upon is a good level, but we all have individual styles and signatures. It's a very exciting organization, and and it is, like you say, it is interesting that it operates so differently, and they ends up working with like the biggest clients in the world, but also so many community art organizations and historic organizations. I'm not going to delve far into it because I mean, we, this, we could do basically eight hours talking just about your work at Pentagram because it is so incredible. But I do want to encourage anybody listening who isn't familiar with Pentagram and your work there to go check it out and especially to go find your book, Polisher Work which features over 500 pages and profiles on 300 of, of your individual projects. That book is really, really quite something. It must have taken forever to put together, even on its own, let alone the time it took to create all those separate pieces. Well, fortunately, I didn't do it. Tony Brooke did. Oh, um, nice. Union Editions is um, yeah, a partnership of Adrian Shaughnessy and Tony Brooke in London. 
and they, um, they're amazing book designers and they're working on our 50th book as we speak. Oh, great. Great. So they'll be the same ones who are doing this book. That's going to come out in a couple of years. Yes. I have a book that's kept contemporarily out that is just in the marketplace now called uh, 25 Years at the Public Theater, A Love Story. And it's a history of my identity for the public theater, which is, is kind of ma- massive. And I just, uh, I'm now doing it 27 years, but it's, it's, a, it's an identity that has gone on that whole period of time. Yeah, well, I mean, that identity almost became the identity for New York for uh, quite a long time because everyone else started kind of doing something similar after that did so well. Now, obviously, this podcast is audio, but I am seeing you on video. This is the first recording I've done with video. And um, so I am seeing you uh, sitting in front of one of your gorgeous maps. When did you start painting maps? Um, From a very early period, I did sort of uh, diagrammatic work that were jokes. Um, Some of them were maps. Some of them were charts. Um, They were, I'd made a genealogy chart of graphic design where everything made Milton Glaser. Um, I I made um, uh, sort of, fractured political statements and uh i did work for the the new york times sometimes i worked on their op-ed page so i did something called you know diagram of a blog and it was sort of a a blog thread that was depressing and funny um and then i made some paintings of um political maps and they were filled with opinions and uh they sort of would like I remember painting the United States and I, it still would be good today. It was all the states that I considered were just filled with populations of racists and, you know, sort of wrote these things all over the maps. And they were in a small show, I think at New Paltz college. And um, this couple uh, Marvin and Ruth Sackner had a collection uh, called concrete poetry and they, they bought word art and um, they're serious and they bought two of my maps and I was, I was really charmed by it. I had never had that experience where somebody, a collector, went to a, sh- a show and bought two of my works to, to add to their collection. So I was, I was continuing along the, the Spain of doing these small drawings. I made a, uh, uh-oh, I think, I think that, can, can we pause for a minute? Sure, absolutely. Okay, my dog is going crazy because a FedEx truck is cool. No worries. I got to deal with this. We were talking a moment ago about the map paintings. Um, they're sort of, I would say, abstract expressionist information. This is the way I would describe them. They, um, they tell a truth, but it's a half truth. But when you look at them, they're sort of right. I remember um, I had done, painted the United States something like 10 feet high by 14 feet wide. And it was hanging in the Cooper Hewitt for about six months. And I was up there for something or other. And I saw two men standing in front of it and they were talking about some trip they took. And they, they were like using the nap, uh. navigate. I started to laugh. I mean, you know, I mean, things are sort of in the wrong place, but on the other hand, they're, they're nearby. Yeah, yeah. So they, you know, they tell a partial truth. And uh, sometimes the maps are filled with statistics. Um, sometimes they're uh, really mostly about populations. Um, the latest series I'm doing, the one behind you is on weather. Um, and uh, I'm in the middle of a series on that. I, I recently, uh, a collector sent me a Porsche to paint. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I'm painting the United States on a Porsche, and it's really hard to fit it on there. <laughs> I'm doing that right now. But, but I, you know, I work in acrylic the paintings take me as long as they take. They're the opposite of design. Um, I do them for myself. I have two galleries. I hope I sell things, but it's not what's motivating it. It's more the act of making, which is, is pure. And it's not, I don't feel like I'm a businesswoman doing them. I feel like I'm a maker. Yeah. Do you remember what, around what year you started making these? I sure do. I started painting them large. That's when I considered myself serious about it. They were small. Like I said, they were small scale things and there are quite a few of them. But when they got large, they really became a big body of work. Um, 
I, I had been working on the Citibank identity. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had bought the logo really fairly quickly. Um, we designed it quickly because they were looking to launch it immediately and they couldn't do it because they had a they, there was a merger in the company. So there was part of the company that was from Citibank and a part of the company that was from Travelers Insurance, which had actually, which had actually bought City. And during this period, after they settled on the logo, it took a year to sell it through the company um, yeah. and, and then get all the various divisions to use it and make the stuff. And I was continually making presentations of the same design and reselling it and reselling it. And I felt like I didn't make anything anymore. Not only that, but everything is done on the computer. And I felt like I didn't make anything with my hands. You know, like I'd be working with my team and they'd be moving the stupid city back logo around with the color blue. I mean, there's only a certain amount of that I could do. So I went up to Connecticut where I have a weekend house and I began painting. And I began, I first, I, my first map was actually comparatively small and then they just got bigger and, and uh, they can take three months or six months uh, and it doesn't matter. Do you work on more than one at a time? No, I never can do more than one at a time. I mean, there are. Sometimes I have one half finished and I start another one because I get a commission. Yeah, yeah. But I haven't. The commissions can make me a little fraught because I feel a responsibility to actually finish them <laughs> and get them done on time. Where, where the, the other thing that motivates me is having a show. Like if I'm having a show, then I really, I really can do much more output and I'll stay up all night doing them. But mostly, mostly they're for my pleasure. You can tell that because they are extremely beautiful. The amount of effort that goes into them can only come from pleasure and from love. How did they go from being these paintings on canvases to some of the like kind of immersive room experiences where you've had these printed on like digital carpet? So the entire carpet in the room is your map, but then the, it continues right up the wall and on sometimes onto ceilings. I'm curious to know how that started. Uh, Ellen Lupton, who is curator of the Cooper Hewitt, asked me, because I had the, the United States hanging there, she asked me to do the elevators of the Cooper Hewitt to, to fill them with graphics that were like the map. So I painted uh, a painting of Manhattan, like a map, a map of Manhattan, and it, it went uh, down, uh, Broadway went down as a long, thin rug, and then it went inside the elevator and on the walls. Huh. Then I got a commission from the city of New York um, to paint uh, a mural that represented Queens because that's where the school was for, for a new public school that uh, Bloomberg was building. I was competing with two other artists and they were serious artists. And I, I thought, oh God, this is scary. And then I realized I had an edge because they had shown the space as a, you know, like sort of a big mural down a wall and the space was being used uh, for PTA meetings and uh, special events of the school. And there was a skylight in the room. It was about 2,500 square feet. And I thought they're doing this wrong. Like the mural won't look good on the wall because it's the wrong scale and proportion. They had to fill the whole room. And I knew how to do this because I'm an environmental graphic designer. I make this stuff all the time. It's part of my, my design vocabulary. So we took uh, one of my paintings and we scanned it into the computer and we made it you know, go all over the ceiling and down on the walls. And I went down to the design commission where they were making the choice. I won. I won because I had completely not followed the directions. I didn't use the space for the mural. I just planned this other thing, but it seemed so natural and right. Then um, I had painted the painting. The final painting that was used was painted at about five feet by five feet and, and blown up, you know, eight times out of scale. And the way we did it is I hired um, a, a, like a, a mural and sign painter named Michael Limley, who I work with on a number of my projects. And he uh, projected the painting onto these uh, giant masonite panels. So the painting was blown up and he imitated my handwriting from my wow. painting the uh, projection. And then they were screwed into the wall because it had to be, they had to be removable, you know, if there was a fire and it's part of city of New York's, it's, it's their property. So it had to be made all these code restrictions and ways you had to do it. It was amazing. 
Then I had students at Tyler School of Art do it on paper, and we pushed them into the wall and made another exhibit. I had them paint Philadelphia. What I did is I did the roads, and they filled in all the information of the area, and I made little uh, sort of a proportion sections that 152 students got, and they got a little code on it, and they could find it on Google Maps and paint in the detail, and I gave them the scale of the thing thickness of the brush so it didn't overcome the thick thickness of the line that held the whole thing together. I was amazed. I would love to do that again. I was amazed at how well it worked. It was up for about five months. I've seen photos of the Tyler School of Art piece and it, it does look really incredible. That was the one that actually when I saw that, that was when I kind of knew I had to ask you a little question about those because they are kind of amazing. And I love that the kind of the precipice to start those um, kind of runs back to Ellen Lupton. I actually played host to Ellen Lupton myself and a bunch of colleagues of mine. We brought her here to St. John's Newfoundland a couple of years ago to do one of her talks. And so we got to have her here for the weekend and took her out on a boat and showed her an iceberg for the first time. She'd never seen one before. Well, Ellen's a friend and um, uh, her partner, her husband is my partner. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think she's a genius because she just gives so much insight with every sentence. All right. Well, I'm going to clue up. Well, not with a question. I got a short little story for you, Paula. A couple of years ago, when I started getting the ideas to start this podcast, I posted just on Facebook. What's your favorite album cover? It just started a, a really spirited thread that went on and on and on and on of all these people. Some were posting images, some were posting links. Some started arguing with each other when someone would say they like this record or that record. And someone else would be like, you're crazy. That one's not good. This one's better. One record that came up over and over and over and over again was your Boston cover, which I knew you knew that's probably where I was headed with this. And <laughs> so, and it's interesting because I know it's never been a cover you've, you've particularly been proud of. And it's one you've always been shocked, I think, that has done so well. That record has sold over 20 million copies. That cover has been imitated time and time again. And what I really love, and I, I, I just want you to understand, is that your work, whether it's the logo work, the, uh, the experiential work, you know, your album work, all of it has just been so cherished and loved. And there's so many people, apparently over 20 million, that have that record in their home and love it. And uh, from my thread, that record was the one that got the most comments. <laughs> their favorite album cover of all time. And so thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for chatting with me and thanks for uh, giving me your time. Thank you. That was fun. Paula Cher has often referred to the album art on Boston's debut as, quote, a mediocre piece of work, quote. It just shows the power of her creativity, however. Even her mediocre work has resonated in the hearts of audiences all over the world. That album came out 45 years ago, and I am not at all blown away at how often it still comes up in examples of the world's finest album covers. Paula Art directed the project, hiring Roger Heisen to illustrate the main image and Gerard Huerta to create the handmade type that ended up becoming the band's logo from then on. We've had Gerard and Paula on the show, so I guess we're going to have to track down Roger for a chat very soon. Paula has worked on many bigger records than the ones we discussed here today. Albums for Bob Dylan, The Rolling Stones, John Prine, and Billy Joel, among others. But when she said that she enjoyed working on jazz records the most, as those were the ones she got to let her hair down, I really wanted to pursue that, as jazz isn't a genre that most designers get to spend too much time with. I loved when she talked about laying a piece of clear transparency over a photo or layout so she had a surface to paint the typography. I've never thought to try that and will definitely be giving it a shot on a project soon. It was also very interesting when she brought up how folks waste so much time these days making changes to design projects, and that is something that just wasn't done back in the day. And it's so true. How many clients send me all their texts for an album jacket saying it's all been approved and it's final, then send updates and changes every day for a month? Computers definitely have made it too easy to nitpick little details which has morphed the designer's job too often into focusing on editing text over and over that should have been properly proofed long before it was sent in. There's so much more to learn from Paula, not just about album cover art, but if you're an enthusiast of design on any level, Paula is the master. I don't think there's a more celebrated designer currently working on this planet, and I'm still absolutely shocked and very, very honored that she spent an afternoon talking shop with me. 
You can find some of her work at behance.net slash Paula Scheer, or just do a Google search of her name and you'll be blown away at what you find. If you haven't watched her episode of the Netflix series Abstract, you're going to love it. I've posted links to both that Abstract episode and that Behance page over on the show notes at artdesignmusic.com. Now, I've been asking every guest if they'd be willing to come back on to answer any listener questions on our 11th episode, but I didn't have the guts to ask Paula. So while this is the time, I usually tell folks that you can write in and ask our guests a question, which is true, just not Paula. But if you want to ask myself or any of the other guests a question, we'd love to hear from you. We'll be answering those questions on episode 11, as well as reading some comments, show ideas, and other fun stuff from listeners. Send along your questions or comments to artdesignmusicpodcast at gmail.com. Paula mentioned designing John Prine's Common Sense album, and while we didn't dig deeper into that design story, I did pick up a brand new copy of the record on vinyl that I'll be giving away to some lucky listener on episode 11. All you have to do is submit a question or comment or follow either our Facebook or Instagram pages by the time the 11th episode airs and you're automatically in the draw for the John Prine record as well as a whole bunch of other prizes. Find us on Instagram and Facebook at Art Design Music Podcast. And the email for questions or comments, once again, is artdesignmusicpodcast at gmail.com. As always, I want to thank Lowell Campbell for playing all the awesome drum beats featured in this and every episode of Art Design Music. You can find more about him on Instagram at Lowell Campbell, and his band's website is wintersleep.com. If you're curious to check out any of my work, you can find me on Instagram at Mighty Pops. That's M-I-G-H-T-Y-P-O-P-S. And my portfolio website is judhaines.com. That's J-U-D-H-A-Y-N-E-S dot com. As it turns out, it costs a lot more to make a podcast than Lowell and I had ever anticipated when we started this thing. But when we look at the normal ways people make money off podcasts, they're all a little cheesy. I don't want to be reading silly ads here promoting manscaping. So in an effort to offset some of the costs, we've made some fun merch that you're welcome to check out on our website at artdesignmusic.com. There's t-shirts, stickers, beanies, and pins, all that say art design music. And we think you're going to find them totally cute and will feel empowered out in the world, showing off your allegiance to the world of art, design, and music. Special shout out and thank you to the folks who've already gone ahead and ordered themselves a t-shirt or a hat. Thank you so, so, so much. On our next episode, we're talking to Hayden Menzies, best known as the drummer of Sub Pop's heaviest punk rock sons, Mets. One of Canada's best exports and one of the most crushing live bands I've ever seen. But what many don't know is that Hayden is also an incredible illustrator. His work has appeared on album covers, t-shirts, and posters for bands all over, including Thurston Moore, Blink-182, Hannah George's, and All the World's Parties Festival, among so many more. I often tell people that Hayden is my favorite Canadian artist, and he was the very first person I wanted to talk to when we had the idea for this podcast. I hope you'll join us as we go deep talking about art, music, and what both of us did to end up banned from entering the United States. That's next up on Art Design Music. See you then. Bye.